Hello and Namaste. In our very last session, we spoke about burning desire. We cannot attain liberation without an intense and burning desire. It is this burning desire that inspires on the path of sadhana. To briefly summarize our last session, it said that temporary or momentary desire for liberation does not yield fruits. It may be because you had a terrible experience, you suffered loss of loved ones, you are unhappy because you're living in poverty, you are miserable because you're lonely and have no partner or family. And so this temporary desire for liberation, to be freed from suffering, when this comes up, it is only because of a reason, a cause. And if the cause is treated, the desire for liberation disappears. So a person who is lonely, has no partner, has no family, suddenly gets married or has a family and is no longer feeling miserable, then he is not thinking about liberation. And this is what we have seen time and again, and these experiences are temporary. It's due to difficult circumstances in life. It is like the human reaction when we are driving very fast on the highway and we see an accident. We see some cars smashed up. We see ambulances, we see people being carried away. Maybe you even see some gruesome scenes. And this inspires us to drive more carefully, slowly. But after a while we forget that. And then again we start driving fast and carelessly and sometimes even recklessly. So the desire for liberation is a bit like that. We experience some difficulties in life and we all become very philosophical and experience these temporarily of fleeting moments of samadhi. And this desire, however, is not enough to yield fruits. For liberation, an intense and continuous one-pointed desire for liberation is necessary. Today we will go further into this idea of burning desire. In our text, Parshurama is speaking to his teacher, Dattatreya, teacher of teachers. And he asks his teacher, Tathatreya, to clarify his confusion. I am reading from verse 47, chapter 19. Hearing the words of Dathatreya, Parshurama, with the desire of clarifying his confusion, asked, O Master, first you said that satsang, the company of the sages, is the main means of liberation. Then you said, it is the grace of God. And again you say, by seeing the imperfections in the objects of the world, one strengthens non-attachment. What is the prime means of attaining moksha? How can that be attained? It is definite that nothing happens without a reason. Therefore, how can intense desire, the means of liberation, be causeless? Please kindly explain in detail. So during the course of this scripture, we have learned that 
Satsang, the company of sages, is one of the main means of liberation. At other times it said that it is the grace of God. Then again it said, if you see the world to be temporary and imperfect, if you understand this, it will strengthen your spirit of vairagya and this will lead to liberation. And now again, he says, causeless, intense burning desire is the means of liberation. How can that be possible? So many different means of liberation which is the prime means which is the most important one this is what Parashurama would like to understand it is a very good question those asked by sincere dedicated seekers that is what this text is about in question and answer form it puts forward all the questions that any seeker has asked to his master. In verse 50, Dattatraya responds. Compassionate Dattatraya spoke, O Parshurama, listen to the foremost path leading to the final goal. Pure consciousness through her power of will projected the image of the universe within herself like the images in a mirror. That power assumed the form of Hiranyagarbha, the firstborn, with the desire to dispel the darkness of ignorance from human beings and created scriptures like an ocean of knowledge. In the world, individuals have many types of desires. With the thought of benefiting them, Hiranyagarbha created wish-yielding objects of the world. Human beings by nature perform good and evil karmas. To accomplish a particular purpose in life, they are born as human beings and then become the slaves of their own karmas as they continue performing karmas. No obstacle arising arises in fulfilling my desire. That such an exclusive desire one surrenders himself to God. He studies the scriptures to understand God. Listening to the results of the sadhana and motivated by its fruits, he begins to practice. But in the midst of practicing, he commits a mistake and does not obtain the desired fruit. Then he seeks the company of an adept. So here in these few verses, Tattatraya explains the background that pure consciousness, whether you call this pure consciousness Atman, whether you call it Buddha nature, you call it Shakti, universal consciousness, you call it Divine Mother or Shiva, Whatever you call this, you may call it God. This pure consciousness projects this universe and world that we know around us like images on a mirror. Individuals live out their desires in this world. And whilst doing so, they perform good and bad karma. Finally, through development, an individual reaches that point where he surrenders himself to God. 
And he says, he declares to himself, no obstacle arises in fulfilling my desire, my desire for the highest. He studies the scriptures. <clears throat> he practices. <clears throat> but while practicing, he makes a mistake. A mistake here does not mean a mistake like we'd imagine it, but it is perhaps incorrect practice. Due to misunderstanding, due to lack of guidance. And so, such a sadhak, such a seeker, gets stuck. The mind is complex, as we know, for those of you who may meditate. It's not easy to be a witness. Most of us practice techniques. Very few of us go beyond to be really able to observe the mind and understand the deeper mysteries of life. In order to do that, very often we need some guidance. We need to have someone to lead us or guide us who has traveled this path before. You seek out the company of an adept. And this is when really the journey begins. Because before that, there was a lot of exploration. There was living out deeper desires, worldly desires, and going through the ups and downs of life. Practicing techniques, very often as we see, a little bit put together by oneself, by reading different scriptures, listening to different teachers, but still unwilling to surrender or to accept the guidance of one teacher. The ego is strong. Ahankara does not wish to submit to the guidance of one teacher. So it is only when Ahankara finds no other way out. He tries, he does everything possible, reads more books, <laughs> listens to more teachers, tries every poss possible practice and is still unhappy, still miserable and so finally comes to accept that he must seek out the company of an adept. So, Tattatreya continues in verses 60 onwards. Benefited by the company of the wise, listening to them regarding the highest reality, by the grace of the great Lord, he starts treading the path with full vigor. In the company of the sages, his good past deeds help him in climbing the ladder of sadhana systematically. In this way, satsang, company of the saints, is the prime cause for attaining the highest good. However, sometimes with the fruitation of great virtuous deeds or rigorous austerities, the highest good is attained suddenly like a fruit bestowed from the sky. The state of attainment of sadhakas varies. So, these verses explain that keeping the company of the sages is a wonderful thing. And in, while practicing and keeping the company of sages, these virtuous deeds might fructify. And like a fruit that is bestowed on you suddenly from the sky, it, like a ripened fruit which falls from a tree, this comes to you and you may attain. But that's something to do with grace and to do with also past deeds. On the other hand, what happens to the rest of them? 
verse 65 says, One whose mind is free from the impurities of the desire for enjoyment attains knowledge with little effort. One whose mind has no tinge of selfish desire attains knowledge in a short time. One whose mind is enveloped by desires attains only a glimpse of knowledge. Such a seeker makes effort for a long time to attain pure knowledge. This is the reason seekers differ in their behavior. So there are those who have impurities for the enjoyment of worldly objects. And so these need longer time. Those whose minds are free from these desires will attain with little effort. Those who have overcome their own selfish desires will attain in a shorter time. On the other hand, those who have a lot of selfish desires will not. So, there are different categories of seekers. O Parshurama, these differences indicate differing degrees of ignorance. That is why seekers appear different. O Parshurama, observe the different states of the, end of the seekers. Brahma, Vishnu and Mahadev. These three are self-enlightened by nature, but they are different according to their nature and qualities. We cannot say they are not fully enlightened, but their nature and qualities are different. So this is a very interesting uh, insight into the nature of enlightened beings. And here we are given to understand that Brahma, Vishnu and Mahadev are enlightened by nature. For a lot of you who are listening, this may sound unusual because many of us have grown up with the idea that these are some kind of gods. They have godlike qualities, divine qualities, and the reason for this divinity is the self-luminous nature of the light of consciousness. The closer you are to that pure consciousness, the closer you are to becoming a free soul, the clearer your self-enlightened nature. So while all three of them are enlightened beings. They are still different. They have different qualities. Similarly with sadhakas as well. Those seekers who come, they have different natures. Some have very strong materialistic tendencies. Others may have a good education or a foundation in knowledge but may lack discipline. There are others who are extremely disciplined but have a baggage of negative karma. There are others who have had glimpses of self-realization, short little glimpses that have motivated them to practice. And others have had a lot of suffering. So while those who have had glimpses of enlightenment are drawn to it and pulled towards it, they practice because they want to and love it. Those who come to this part due to suffering, are pushed into it. They suffer and they struggle a lot and sadhana does not always come easily to them. So these are some of the different natures of sadhaks.
verse 73. As a fair-complexioned jnani does not become dark, similarly the nature of the mind does not change. O Vashurama, look at me and my brothers. We are all three illuminated sons of Atri. But Durvasa, Chandrama and myself have vast differences in our states of mind. Durvasa is easily agitated. Chandrama is an enjoyer of objects. And I have renounced all identification. Look at Vashishta, who continually performs ceremony, while Sanaka and others are renunciates. Narada is observed in devotion. The son of Vigu, Sukracharya, supports demons and composes poetry, while Brihaspati grants favors to the gods. Vyasa is highly skilled and remains absorbed in writing scriptures. See Janaka, he lives as a king, while Bharata renounced his kingdom. O Parshurama, similarly, you can see many other yogis with different characteristics. I will tell you the reason behind it. Listen to me. So these verses clarified further the different nature of seekers and enlightened ones. So you have some sages who are enlightened but still display signs of anger and agitation and others who enjoy worldly objects. Some are renunciates, others are kings. Some are performing rituals, others are absorbed in devotion. Some even support demons, others support gods. So, all of them, while being enlightened, occupy themselves in different ways. Yes. So, Verse 79. I have explained the three types of impurities of the mind. Among them, the second one, karmic impurity, is the worst. Those whose minds are not tainted by this impurity are medhavans, quick to grasp and able to retain. The environment of their present life does not bind them. For them, neither the practice of meditation nor non-attachment is necessary. Nor does samadhi become a prerequisite for liberation. By being free from all desires, no doubt they attain the highest state of knowledge and become examples like Janaka, who was a liberated being. Their faculty of discrimination is very one-pointed and pure. Therefore, they do not need to control their desires. Even knowing the absolute impressions of all samskaras continue to exist, such a pure mind does not identify itself with ignorance. Learned its people call them liberated and great men. So, we are talking about those who are not tainted by their own impurity of their past and they are able to grasp and retain. And even though they may be living out in life, living out their desires, such as the king, great king Janaka as a king, still remained liberated and he was not bound by these desires. He remained one-pointed and pure. This is 87 onwards. O Parshurama, one whose mind becomes dense as a result of attaining the fruits of his actions, will not attain knowledge. 
even if Shankara becomes his teacher. Similarly, the practitioner whose mind is not free of skepticism does not attain knowledge. Those who are less skeptical and have minimum desires attain knowledge only after studying, contemplating, meditating and making efforts for a long time. And in certain cases, the seekers are not firmly established in their practice. Therefore, in them, a few desires still exist because their minds are not completely purified. They are called even-minded and their state of mind is comparatively lower than that of the higher sadhakas. They are only practitioners. But the first and second categories of adepts are liberated. So now, Lord Dattatreya speaks of another category. He said in the first and second categories, they are liberated, the Gyanis and the Medhavans. And the third category, they have a lot of desires. Their minds are dense, there is so much fruit of action, their minds are still impure. And even if Lord Shankara this is not referring to Adi Shankara, but is referring to Shiva. Even Shiva becomes his teacher, Shankar. Still you will not attain, <laughs> because the mind is very skeptical, full of doubts. When this mind is less skeptical and has fewer desires, then you will attain by studying, contemplating, meditating, making efforts. They need to work on purifying their minds. So, this is a lower category of sadhakas. All the knowers of truth have to reap the fruits of their actions. Therefore, they remain under the influence of their past, karmas, and are free and liberated only after death. However, the higher order of sadhakas, with their purified minds, have overcome such karmas. These adepts have no desires, so the karmas do not sprout. Just as a highly skilled person can efficiently perform several actions simultaneously without making an effort, mistake, there are some jhanis who can do many things at the same time effortlessly. A human being walks, speaks and works with his hands at the same time. How can he do three different things having only one mind? A teacher can easily detect those students who mispronounce their recitations during the class. So, here we see that there is a higher order of sadhakas are very different. They are very skilled. And just like you are used to doing many different things, you go for a walk and you talk to your friend, or you're working, you're cooking in the kitchen and in the simultaneously you are talking to somebody, you you speak to somebody on the phone and still you're working with your hands at the same time. How is it possible to do multiple things, even though you have only one mind? It's due to awareness and skill. Similarly, a teacher, a sadhaka of a higher category, can also do different things at the same time. He has such a fine, sharp buddhi, and very clear awareness, expanded awareness, that he can even detect a very fine little mispronunciation of a student in a class during, a larger class during recitations. This example is referring to a class of Brahmin students learning to recite the Vedic hymns. So this requires a fine year and heightened awareness perception. And that is the difference between 
the lower category and the higher category of Salax. Verse 101 O Parshurama, you killed the great warrior King Sahasrajuna, who was highly skilled and used many weapons at once, yet his weapons never missed their target. You have seen it. The minds of those accomplished ones perform many actions simultaneously. Similarly, the inner being of the highest order of adepts remains undisturbed, while the adepts are working in the world. They are a special category of people. So we see now that once again he gives another example and says that the adepts or the higher category of sadhakas are different. They are able to perform multiple tasks, have a higher, higher awareness and they are very skillful. We see that ourselves in tasks like driving. When you first started to learn driving, it was very difficult because you did not know where to concentrate on. What shall you learn to, to move the steering wheel? Should you change the gears? Should you brake and accelerate? Should you look in front of you and see the traffic? There seem to be so many different things that the mind needs to concentrate on. And yet, within a few months, we are able to do that. And in a few years, it's so easy that you wonder, hmm, how should it be difficult at all? So, in all areas, it's a development of skill which is involved and a matter of practice. So, these higher category of sadhakas, simply far more experienced and appear to us to be great beings in reality. You don't wonder at the amazing skills of a very experienced driver. You know that this driver has had many years of experience. It's similar for sports. If you look at somebody who is very skillfully skiing, you require a lot of skill for skiing. And if you wonder how is it possible that they can ski down high mountain slopes with such skill, you'd be scared. It's frightening when you, you look at it and you see that. And yet, it's merely a matter of practice. So, a little bit further about the special category of people, this, this higher category. Verses 104 onwards. The moment karma sprouts in their minds, it is burned by the fire of knowledge. All samskaras are like the sprouts of the seed of desire. This is the cause of pain and pleasure. But when the sprout is burned, how can it yield fruits? When old people play with children and the toy breaks, they express the same grief and sorrow as the children do. Similarly, adepts experience and express desire, pain, pleasure in the midst of their actions. As a person whose mind is concentrated somewhere else, experiences his grief or pleasure superficially, but never from within. Likewise, while acting in the world, the internal being of an adept remains undisturbed in all conditions. So, here we are talking about the special category of people, category 1, Janis, category 2, Medhavins, and these are categories 
of seekers with highly purified minds. And already their karma has been burned by the seeds of, by the fire of knowledge. The seeds of desire have been burned. So what happens when you roast a seed? The example used commonly, and it's also used in the Yoga Sutras, when the seeds are roasted, it can no longer germinate. So the same with the sprout, it's using the term sprouts here, and says it cannot germinate further. It is maybe you can say nipped in the bud and it will not yield fruit anymore. It is like an adult who is playing with children. The toy breaks and the children start crying and you also feel sad and you say, oh, you poor thing, and such a lovely toy broke. And you show compassion for the situation of the child. But you know within you, that's just a little toy. And you don't laugh at the child. You don't make fun of the child. You are compassionate. But that grief and sorrow is not touching you within. And so also, such an adept, he appears to go through life doing everything that normal people do. You cannot see it from outside, but internally his mind is established in the self. Some of us know it when you are out somewhere and somebody's talking to you but your mind is somewhere else you're not really listening so you may not really experience that meeting with say friends you're out with friends and you're you're not really present because maybe you're worried your mind is somewhere else so also an adept like this level he may appear to be involved in the world doing things, but his mind is not really there. He is established in the self all the time. So now this is actually very different from some of you might say, oh, but this is not good because whatever you do, you should do with full awareness. And yes, that is true for all of us. We're talking about the special category of people who are witnesses because they are not really of this world. They are in this world, but they are not of this world. They're participating, they're doing things, but none of this touches them, which is why often the example is used, the symbol of the lotus. It is in the world, but it is above. And... The water of the world does not touch the lotus, it drips off. Many of us have heard about the lotus effect. When you take your car to a car wash, the next time it rains or there is dirt, the car, the, the, the rain water just pearls off, you know, it, it, it forms little droplets which which don't really stick to the car windscreen. And there's a kind of a film which protects the windscreen of the car. <clears throat> this is called the lotus effect. And it is called so because it has been observed in the lotus as well. You may have seen it yourself if you... Take a lotus or a flower like lotus and splash water on it. The water suddenly becomes little drops. It doesn't really become fully wet. It has a hydrophobic quality, the lotus. And so also these higher category of sadhakars called witnesses or having Sakshi Bhav, they remain established in the self and all the things in the external world do not really touch them.
versus 100. These highest adepts neither have to work towards replacing their negative desires with positive ones, nor have to restrain any sort of mental modifications. Among this higher category of adepts, some are seen occupied with work, some enjoying the objects of the world, and others losing their temper, and so on. That's kind of funny. This is, of course, referring to some of the popular mythological stories, all of which are symbols of meditation. While these days it has become quite uh, common to read interpretations of the various symbols in uh, mythology or about gods and goddesses, most of these remain of an academic nature, of a creative nature. When you go into deeper meditation, only then do these real, the real meaning of these stories are revealed to you. They are in fact maps that can help you in your development along the path of meditation. These stories, these mythological stories, are what yogis also call Sandhya Bhasha, the language of dawn and dusk. This is when the dualities drop away and this language which is symbolic in nature is only understood by other meditators and adepts. And even attempting to explain these to somebody who does not meditate or who has only an intellectual interest will not be really very successful because an academic mind tends to understand things purely at an intellectual level. And if you have not had that direct experience in meditation, you will never really understand it. It's like saying, I can explain to you how to get from, from Frankfurt to London, but that's quite different from actually driving yourself from Frankfurt to London. I can give you directions on how to get there, but when you drive yourself, you will find that the directions have only a very limited use. And so, when you are on the path of meditation, these stories are like milestones. They guide you along the way. And you only understand them really and truly when you actually take the journey. And so, many of these adepts, they, they are witnesses and they are established in the self. So, what do they do? when they're already established in the self. They still have some samskaras, which have to be lived out. They don't have, these samskaras don't have a power of, over them. In the sense, they do not suffer due to these. And these samskaras don't have a quality of binding them anymore. But they are lived out all the same. So what do these Jayanis do? What do these witnesses do? They don't feel the need to change their negative habit patterns into positive ones. They simply let go the negative ones. And if they have to be lived out, they're lived out. They don't feel the need to restrain their thoughts. And therefore, what happens is that sometimes you find that they are losing their temper. Or they are excessively enjoying objects of the world. Others are performing good work. 
because they have perhaps purified themselves and have a good inner uh, nature. All the same, a word of caution here, just because somebody claims to be a teacher and is at the same time enjoying the objects of the world and <laughs> losing his temper does not mean that he is a witness. We shall never know. You can never tell from outside. As an external observer, either you trust or you don't trust. As we have discussed, the low category of seeker already has a firm conviction about what is true and what is untrue. But while realizing the self or attaining samadhi, he remains unaffected by the past subtle impressions of his past karmas. In other states, he can be affected by the impulses of joy or grief. So, What's the difference between the lower category and the higher category? In the higher category, you always remain unaffected by the external world. But in the lower category, you will be affected by your karma. But when you're in a state of samadhi, when you're at your seat, when you're practicing, then you have this direct experience. So what it means is, in the lower categories, this quality of awareness has not spilled into day-to-day -day life, or has spilled into day-to-day -day life, but only in a limited way. Actually, realizing the self is called samadhi. There is nothing beyond that. One absolute, self-existent Atman is the very foundation of all activities. If it doesn't exist, nothing will happen. From different internal states of knowledge arises Nirvakalp Samadhi, the highest state of Samadhi. So, Samadhi is it, that's what you want. But there are different stages of Samadhi. These are outlined in the Yoga Sutras. And the highest state is Nirvikalp Samadhi. From the viewpoint of realized adepts, consciousness is entirely different from the external world, even while they seem to be active in the world. Those who have understood the unreality of the blueness of the sky still see the sky as blue, though they are fully aware of the unreality of the colour. Likewise, though they are pragmatic in daily life, Arabs are fully aware that reality is like the void. Had it not been like that, there would be no difference between the seer and the seen. So what is it with the adept? He is established in the self and yet he is active in the world. He is like all of us. We, we see the sky, we see it's blue, we know it's not real, but we have accepted it's blue and we enjoy that wonderful blue colour. For those of us who live in countries where there's maybe not so much sun, very cloudy, rainy weather, the moment there's a blue sky and there's sunshine, everybody enjoys that. Winter is over, summer starts, and there are fabulous images of blue skies and sunny uh, weather. Everybody's happy. Even though you know that that blue sky is not real. So, similarly, adepts, they go through life they enjoy it, they do what they have to do, even they, though they know that all this is 
a play of consciousness. Verse 118 onwards. After knowing the unreality of external objects, an adept is not influenced by them, even while experiencing them. That is why, for the highest of adepts, your consciousness is not an object. The adepts who are constantly aware of Atman remain in the state of no mind. For them, the experience of the external world has ceased. When the mind is centered in the self, it is called the state of Unmani, the transcendental mind. And when it becomes associated with external objects, considering them to be real, that is called an unsteady mind. The highest Arabs are like the citizens of two states, O Parshurama, such an adept lives in the world, yet simultaneously lives above. Thus, in the view of adepts, consciousness is always like the void. Now I have answered all your questions. Thus ends chapter 19 with the explanation of the various states of realized sages. So we see that the three different states, different characteristics of the sadhakas require different means for liberation. So it is very useful to keep the company of sages. It's good to strengthen the longing for desire. It's important to do your practice. It's important to cultivate non-attachment. And it's also important to have insights into the nature of the higher category of seekers. And why are they still called seekers if they are in, established in, sama, in the state of the self, in samadhi? If they have experienced their real recurb samadhi, why are they still called seekers? Because this is still not total liberation. This is not Kevalya. They are still in the body. They are still in this plane of existence. And eventually, when the potter's wheel ceases to turn, they will return back to the source, to universal consciousness. So this is an example of the potter's wheel, as many of you may know it. When the pot is being made, the wheel keeps turning. Then the pot is removed, but still the wheel turns until eventually it stops turning on its own. But until then, it keeps turning. And so it is with the samskaras that we have. They lose their power and... Yet, there is the body and you are still living out things until the wheel stops turning. And when the wheel stops turning, such an adept returns to the source. He may not have to return to this plane of existence and take a body. If he has attained the state of Nirvikal Samadhi, he can also live out some of the more subtle karma, subtle samskaras in the states of the subtler states of consciousness in a disembodied state. So in our next session we will continue with the Tripura Rasya and we will do chapter 20 the appearance of Sri Tripura Sundari herself, the goddess, and her teaching. 
So I hope you enjoyed this. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.